wonderful to see so many familiar faces. I don't think I've looked out at two audiences and seen so many familiar faces as my wedding. So it's great to see you all here. Um, and, and thank you so much. And no more emails. <laughs> you can just enjoy now. Um, so here we go. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk for about 35 or so minutes. Please, can you hear it okay? No, I'll get, I'll get real close. Um, uh, please be writing down remembering questions. I want lots of questions. I want lots of discussion. Yeah, it's on. It's on. Okay now? Maybe the acoustics are not so great. Okay, here we go. Now we're all right? Anybody can hear me? Just raise your hand and we'll turn up the dial. Okay, here we go. So, um, thank you for coming to hear a story that is very near and dear to me. Even if you don't eat meat, I think you're going to I said near because our story takes place a stone's throw from here. In these three buildings at what is now 1 to 5 Little West 12th Street. Between 1919 and 1986, my family ran a meat business out of these buildings. It was called Ottman Company. The buildings are located at that very big intersection, just about four or five blocks north of here, at 9th Avenue coming north-south, and Gansevoort and Little West 12th Street running east to west. It's a little hard to see that, but maybe you recognize the buildings and the intersection. Um, you can see the Gansevoort Hotel rise just behind the building, so it's on that same island, if you will, uh, right smack, just below 14th Street. In our day, that space was a parking lot. And if my grandmother had had the money to buy that lot during World War II, I suspect I'd be relaxing this evening on a private island. <laughs> Starting in 1962, we rented this gorgeous building, diagonally across at 52 Gansevoort Street. I'm sure you'll recognize that. Oh, yeah. Like all of us here tonight, all four of these buildings look a little different. They today than they did back then. Now, speaking of deer, members of my family are here tonight. We're all in the front couple of rows here. Uh, included among them is my father, Jack Ottman, who is standing in the picture, and he's sitting right here. Raise a hand, Dad. The whole Ottman clan is in town to celebrate Dan's 90th birthday later this month. He's standing in front of a portrait of his father, my grandfather. He was also a Jack Ottman. The elder Jack Ottman founded Ottman and Company in 1918. Dad and his twin brother, Henry, spent their entire careers at Ottman & Company here on the west side of town. But before there was this Ottman & Company, there were two other Ottman & Companies that their father, grandfather, great-uncles, and great-great-uncle, did you get all that, worked at over on the east side of town. So tonight I'm going to be telling you a lot about these two other Ottman & Companies, too. Dad loved every minute of his career at Ottman & Company, and he communicated that love to me. My talk tonight is dedicated to Dad. Aww. Here's a picture of Dad and me taken to the office in July of 1976. It's one of those lucky shots you find in the files. Dad was the president of Ottman and Company, and I was a rising senior in college. So just about Emily Ann's age. Raise your hand, Emily Ann. I spent all of my summers throughout high school and college working in the business, as did my two sisters who were here tonight right in the front row, and our brother. I was endlessly fascinated by this business, and Dad patiently and happily answered my million and one questions each evening as we rode home in the car together up 8th Avenue in the 5 o'clock traffic. So we had a lot of time. <laughs> On the wall, as you can see, are several black and white photographs. There were many photographs like these on the walls at Ockham & Company. We were very proud of our history. 
many ways, Hotman and Company really defined our family. The picture was taken by a photographer from a, re by a reporter from the National Provisioner Magazine. He was in town that July day to do this story about our business. He and others saw that our pioneering meat processing techniques were pretty newsworthy at the time. So my goal tonight is to use the lens of my family's business to give you a better appreciation, as, as Matt said, of what went on in this so-called meatpacking district long before the restaurants, the cafes, and the galleries moved in. First, let's talk about this term, meatpacking district. I think somebody might think that's a little weird of a question, but New York City loves its flower, financial, and garment districts. But I suspect the term meatpacking district was coined by the media or maybe the real estate industry, but not by the people who actually worked here. We all refer to it simply as the market, and for good reason. Starting in 1879, the area that was bound by Gansevoort, Little West 12th Street, and West Streets, so directly across from us, was home to the Gansevoort Market. It was originally called the Farmer's Market. Sound familiar? As you can see from this wonderful image from Harper's Weekly, it was a big open area jammed with horse-drawn produce carts and thousands of shoppers. Five years later, the city built the 10 brick buildings that you see in the background to house meat, poultry, and dairy businesses. That area was called the West Washington Market. And if anyone is familiar with the Washington Market, we can discuss why this is called the West Washington Market about 20 blocks north. Dad was president of the West Washington Market Men's Association at one point. In its heyday around 1920, there were an estimated 150 to 250 different meat businesses in the West Washington Market. Now, some of them were packers, the people who slaughtered the animals. Some of them were wholesalers who bought the meat from the packers. And others were retailers who bought the meat from the wholesalers, as they do, and sold it to the general public. But increasingly, most of the meat businesses in the market were firms like ours. They eventually became known as meat purveyors. Anybody familiar with that term, meat purveyors? Meat purveyors buy meat from the wholesalers. They cut it up into steaks, chops, or prepare it in other ways, and then sell it to hotels, restaurants, cruise ships, airlines, and other places that serve a meat away from home. It's called the away from home market. In 1949, the city built the Gansport Market Meat Center, which still stands. It houses the few meat businesses who are still operating in the area. But unlike what we try to do, which you'll know about in a few minutes, they're still using techniques learned from their fathers and grandfathers to cut fresh meat. So where did all the meat that all these businesses were so busy selling come from? I don't see any pasture land around. <laughs> Most of the meat that came from the market originated from stockyards located in the Hudson Rail Yards up on the far west side. That's now a development called Hudson Yards. Because meat was perishable, cattle historically had to be located close to market. Right up through the 1950s, and some of you are going to find this hard to believe, but cattle were transported across the Hudson on barges from New Jersey and Pennsylvania into the Hudson Yards. Here's a picture of cattle arriving on 39th Street and 11th Avenue around 1959, when most of us, I dare say, were born. After the cattle were slaughtered, the meat would be transported down to the West Washington Market in refrigerated rail cars on a special spur of the New York Central Railroad. Anybody know what that spur is called now? The High Line, exactly. The meat was then sold by wholesalers in big cavernous warehouses like this one. 
Super early in the morning, the buyers in Ackman and Company, including my own father, starting in 1946 when he returned from the war, would go into the market and select the sides of beef, pork, veal, or lamb. So that's my definition of meat tonight, beef, pork, veal, or lamb, no chicken. That had just the right marbling and other characteristics. Later that morning, the meat would be delivered. It would be weighed on the scales you see here, and then moved into coolers in the plant before it would be cut down further and then delivered uptown to our customers. So this meat was all fresh. You had to buy it, cut it, put it on a truck, and send it uptown to hotels. Now, before taking you upstairs, I'd like to take you back in time to briefly review the roots of Jack Ottman's Ottman and Company so you can better appreciate the amazing things we did with the meat once it got upstairs. <laughs> However, before moving on, I just want you to note the spelling of the name of the company. O-T-T-M-A-N and Company. Those other two Ottman and Companies I mentioned, they spelled their names with two N's on the end. Like these two fellows right here in this front row. If you listen real closely, I'll tell you how that second end disappeared. 61 years before Jack Ottman founded his Ottman and Company, his great uncle Philip founded his own Philip Ottman and Company. Philip had immigrated to New York from a little town in southwest Germany called Meisenheim. The town records show that the Ottmans were butchers, perhaps for generations. Philip brought his finely owned old world meat cutting skills with him and in 1859 set up shop at the Fulton Market at the South Street Seaport. He had the corner stalls, see it says you can barely see his butchers and packers on the corner. In those days, the butchers and the fishmongers all were located together until the butchers eventually migrated over to the West Washington market that was built for them. This invoice from 1875 describes Philip Ottman's company as butchers at numbers 25, 31, and 33 Fulton Market. Philip's brother died the same year he left for America, or one of his brothers, they all were eight and nine children. Seven years after he arrived and got himself set up, in 1865 he brought over his sister-in-law, Margaretha, who's pictured on the left wall, and her eight children, as you can see in this oil portrait that is, is, is on the wall in my father's living room. All five of these boys worked in their Uncle Philip's business as young men, just like we all did in the summers. Four of them would eventually work for him full time, including this little boy on the right, another Philip, spelled with two P's on the end, who later would become the father of our senior Jack Ottman. Some of you will remember a talk that I gave a few years ago saying that the fifth brother went on to print the famous Huck magazine. Eleven years later, in 1876, their Uncle Philip died very surprisingly one night, and his eldest nephew, William, hold that thought, his oldest nephew, Uncle Philip's uh, oldest nephew, Philip, the one reading, William, sorry, this is William Ottman, Getting the guy to get these guys, right? Um, took over the business and renamed it for himself. These two gentlemen in the second row have a father and a grandfather. They're direct descendants of Mr. William Martin. Among William Martin and Company's customers is the Palatine Restaurant. One day they lucked out in buying 270 pounds of loins, chops, and smoked ham from Ottman for a grand total of $26.91. Oh, <laughs> the Palatine restaurant's meat was likely delivered in one of these horse-drawn delivery wagons. If you look closely, you can see William Ottman's name on the first wagon. Thanks to an exploding population in New York at the time, 
and a very busy hotel, restaurant, and steamship trade, William Hutton and Company thrived. Yes, Dan. The grandson of the man who invented Volkswagen did our truck. Oh, I love it. The grandson of the man who led it, put the, painted the wagons, did the trucks for Hutton and Company. <laughs> Thank you, Dad. This first time. Love that. I kept calling Dad every few days. He kept here, here, I, what do you think about this? What do you think about, what do you know about that? And he remembers so much. So, in 1890, five years before his death, William Huntman took advantage of a big opportunity to grow his company through export. His business was acquired by another meat man with German roots, Mr. Bernhard Beinecke. Here he is in the mid-1880s with his wife, Johanna. Mr. Beinecke was a very enterprising man. He is related to the library at Yale, we'll talk about that later. In addition to owning his own meat company, Mr. Beinecke also laid claim to the largest stockyards in the Hudson Yards, as well as the plaza and other hotels. In fact, he's credited with founding America's very first hotel chain. Mr. Beinecke recognized the potential of William Hutman and Company to help him realize his dream to create a truly vertically integrated business. In fact, his 1932 obituary lists the acquisition of William Hutman and Company as a crowning achievement. William Hutman likely thought it was a good deal too. Emerging with Beinecke, Hutman got access to markets in Europe and other resources while continuing to operate independently. After his death in 1895, all three of William's younger brothers, including our young Philip, continued to work at Ottman & Company under the auspices of Mr. Beinecke for several more years. But whatever independence they had from Mr. Beinecke apparently wasn't enough for our young Philip's son, Jack. You remember him from the portrait on my father's office wall. When he reached 32 years of our age in 1918, Jack Ottman, pictured here with his bride, all of my grandmother, decided to strike out on his own. But he had a little problem. Mr. Beinke owned the name Ottman. So in order to take advantage of his family's stellar meat reputation, in 1919, he brazenly dropped the second N from the name and founded O-T-T-M-A-N and Company. In doing so, he not only set his firm apart from William Hotman, but akin to landing on the first page of a Google search today, he bolted his firm atop William Hotman and Company's in the phone book. <laughs> He ostensibly convinced his father, Philip, to leave William Ockman and Company, or perhaps he too was ready to go, making him president of the new firm. It was an offer that must have sounded pretty enticing to the youngest of five boys. Here's a picture of Ockman and Company's first location at 446 West 13th Street. Jack is on the right. His father, Philip, is in the middle, and a man named Hoffman, spelled with two ends, is on the left. As an aside, I understand that butchers always wore straw boaters. Anybody know why? So that at any given time, they were at least two inches away from a swinging meat hook. <laughs> The next year, Jack moved his new company into the largest of these three buildings, whose address at the time, as it was for us, was number 2 Ninth Avenue. On April 15, 1919, Jack threw an opening day party. Jack is in the back row on the far left, uh, standing to the left of that little child. My grandmother with the open collar is characteristically sitting right smack in the middle of the front row. My grandmother. 
Jack's father, Philip, now 64 years old, a little boy in that painting, is on the far left. And his two sisters who are having tea, I know the painting went by quickly in the painting, are sitting right next to him. And he's wearing a derby hat, which Dad told me was very typical of the butchers when they got dressed up. My cousin, Aiden, Aiden, how old are you? Eleven is here tonight with his father, Jake. Aiden, here's your great-grandparents are in this picture. Have you ever seen this picture before? Okay, so Henry Aiden Ottman is the third man from the left in the back row. He was the first treasurer of Ottman and Company, and he was first cousins with Jack Ottman. And of course, he is the only son of William Ottman. And your great-grandmother, Gail Kane, who was a noted actress in her day, as your father can tell you, was seated way over on the far right. Those are your relatives, I am. Now, if you all look closely, you can see the sawdust that kept the floor dry and what looks like a pretty display of meat in the background. <laughs> Here's another view of Jack Ockman's building as it stands today. This is the building he moved into. How many architecture buffs are in the room? This is for you. The building was built in 1913 by William Vincent Astor. It was pictured here. It was Brooks, Astor's husband. As many of you know, the Astors were among the wealthiest families in New York. They owned a lot of land in the whole Gansport Market area, as they did all over the city. Jack Ottman, are you guys sitting down? Jack Ottman paid Vincent Astor $3,600 a year plus taxes to rent what was likely two or three floors in this building. The story told to us by our grandmother, Ava, was that they learned that there was space in the building from her father, who was the bookkeeper to Astor's father, John Jacob IV. Jack Ottman eventually bought the building from Vincent Astor in 1943. The building was designed by the architectural firm of Lafarge, Morris, and Cullen as a six-story warehouse to serve the Gansport Market area. It is considered a lovely example of arts and crafts style architecture. Those of you not familiar with arts and crafts, it was a reaction to the shabby architecture that was being created in Europe uh, as a result of the Industrial Revolution. My father told me that over the years they add freezers and do things to the roof, and the architects and the engineers always complimented him on the, on the quality of that, of, the, of that building. So it's considered a lovely example of arts and crafts style architecture with paired windows. You can see couplets on the one side and triplets on the front. Um, and a cornice that was decorated very elegantly, as you see here, with these red tile diamonds. This is a cutout of what's up at the top. Now, let's talk about those red tile diamonds. Another story I heard growing up is that Jack Ottman put those red diamonds on the building because our trademark was a bright red diamond oak, just like what was on the stationery. But I now suspect that this was just another happy accident for Jack Ottman, since I see these same types of buildings on others in the area. Most notably, the Apple Store up on 9th Avenue and 14th Street. For the purists in the room, I cropped out the gigantic billboard on the top of the store. Here's a wonderful old picture of our building and our trucks around 1950. It shows how the building looked once Jack Ottman bought it and made it his own. You can see the still see the, you can still you can see the signs he put up on the third and the fifth floors, and on that second floor corner where the Ninth Avenue elevated train once ran by. He put the, the sign on the corner so the people on the train could could see it. So a little bit of a marketing talent there. Now, unfortunately, I don't have time to get into detail about the two little buildings which we also bought in 1962 and combined into the larger building. But just to mention that they were cleaned within the last few years for the first time in over a century. Here's a color close-up of the little building on the far right. 
For the first time in decades, it's now possible to see the name Middendorf and Roars Grocers painted across the front. It's really quite stunning. I encourage you all to go over there and take a look. I'm proud to say that Jack Ottman's Ottman and Company supplied some of the best restaurants and hotels in New York City, including Lou Shadows, The Palm, The Store Club, and 21. A real feather in Jack Ottman's cap, the firm was the exclusive supplier to Henri Soule's storied Le Pavillon restaurant. It evolved from the French pavilion one of the biggest sensations at the 1939 World's Fair. Here's a picture of Mr. Soleil characteristically overseeing every detail. Jack Ottman was a natural salesman. Here he is with his giant arm around one of his guests, dazzling his customers upstairs on our fourth floor in 1942. Sadly, Jack Ottman died unexpectedly the next year of an aneurysm, right at the height of World War II. And somebody asked me about the implications of, of surviving World War II in the meat business. The good news is that Jack Ottman left behind a legacy and a management team that over the next 56 years would grow and evolve the business in ways that he never could have imagined. That team was first headed up by my grandmother, who you see here, and then by my father, who's next to her, and his brother Henry, second from the right, who died in 1969. Later on, my brother John and my sister Charlene, who's sitting right here, would work full time for the firm. Now, let's fast forward to see what they all achieved and the marvelous things they figured out what to do with that meat once it arrived upstairs. Okay, it looks like we have a little bit of a technical problem. So, I am going to pass around this piece of paper <laughs> that shows it's really the same three buildings, but it's a pastel. And you'll see trucks running around the neighborhood and what have you. And first I will read it and then I will pass it along. Here's a pretend. Here's a pastel of the three buildings and the big wide open streets out front in 1981. The painter put Dad and Charlene, who commissioned it, right in the middle of the hustle and bustle. <laughs> right in the middle of the hustle and bustle that occurred all day long in our intersection. Ottman Company is at its height. It took in $15 million in revenues and employed 135 people. So a small business by today's standards, but with a big story to tell. No more. In telling you the story, I'll be referring back to that other story the reporter wrote once he got back to his desk in Chicago in 1976. Let's take a look. Now,
fat and bones stayed behind, allowing just the saleable meat to be transported to market in these airtight bags instead. So, it was right after World War II. It was probably something they were working on during the war, and then they introduced it. And we got a hold of this and started to play around with this. So, starting in the 1960s, with a little help from Eisenhower's new federal highway system, meat increasingly came into our plant directly from the Midwest. It was transported in these cryovac bags packed in boxes like you see here. So there were some pieces of the meat, not the whole animal, sub, sub cuts. It was transported in, in uh, cryovac bags packed in boxes like you see here. It was delivered by truckers driving refrigerated 18-wheelers all night long. So this is what's called boxed beef, for those of you who know the industry. At the same time, hold on a second. selling our particular brand of meat to customers far and wide. So I've been a company innovated around these diverse needs by pioneering what we called frozen portion control meat. As our expert butchers, after our expert butchers trimmed the meat, it was cut with a band saw in order to get uniformly sized steaks and chops like what you see here. What's not pictured is before the meat was cut, like a whole big tenderloin, it was compressed at 200 pounds per square inch in what's called a betcher press to even out the irre irregular shape. So it kind of turned it into a bit of a block or a roll so you could kind of slice it. The individual steaks and chops were then vacuum packaged in another type of ice airtight seal, like this one, to extend shelf life. Cryovac was suitable for fresh meat, but this package was designed to protect meat during freezing. It was called Bivac, and it was made by DuPont. Have you ever tried to fry freeze a piece of meat? Sure you have and you know all that can go wrong. <laughs> to perfect the art of freezing meat, my father and others worked with Clarence Birdseye himself. In 1930, Clarence Birdseye revolutionized the food industry and secured a place for himself in freezer cases today with his Birdseye brand of frozen vegetables. Dad told me that Mr. Birdseye was inspired to freeze food after seeing an entire fish that he had caught freeze on contact with a sheet of ice. So after it was packed in buyback, the meat would be placed in a contact plate freezer that Birdseye went on to perfect. Meat was loaded onto shelves with refrigerant coursing through them. The shelves would tighten around the meat and the meat would freeze at 60 degrees below zero in two seconds flat. The 
problem when you put meat in the freezer after you lovingly wrap it when you bring it home from the supermarket is it will take six hours for that meat to freeze. And the faster you freeze it, the better, the closer you'll get to fresh when it's thawed. In our heyday, Ackman and Company sold its frozen portion control meat to customers as far west as the Mississippi. And thanks to the advent of shipping containers, we were also able to export meat to 27 countries. My sister Charlene was in charge of that department. During the 1970s, when the Middle East was flush with oil money, it was not uncommon for us to ship 47,000 pounds of the finest meat in America to Saudi Arabia every other week or so. <coughs> It would arrive 30 days later in superb condition. It made quite the meal for Saudi princes, princes who otherwise feasted on lamb, goat, chicken, and camel. Some of our meats were also tenderized with a special process which we called Ottomanizing. <laughs> Dad helped the French inventor Andre Jacquard to perfect his device. It relied upon a multitude of needles instead of chemicals to mechanically tenderize the meat. Some of you may have bought the handheld version in places like the Sharper Image. After a time, many of our customers stopped hiring chefs as well as butchers. It was all part of that ongoing battle to keep the cost, the meat costs, under control. So Ackman and Company pioneered a wine called Chef Ready. It was composed of pre-cooked roasts like what you see here, packed in their own bag with a pop-up thermometer letting you know it was done. So anybody could cook this stuff. A final step, this is the best slide of all, a final step before heading out the door, all of Ackman and Company's meat went through a metal detector. It's a precaution we took in response to a phone call we received one day from our customer at American Airlines, informing us that a passenger in first class had found a bullet in his state. <laughs> Dad told me that over time, they find the occasional staple, staple or paper clip. So we didn't take chances. Here's a photo of one of our senior executives, Jimmy Smith Jr. Senior, senior, sorry, showing off, we had a junior too. Showing off cartons of the final product. Chops, steaks, patties, cutlets, and sticker barbs packed like my grandfather actually predicted. 12 to a box, like Barracini chocolates. <laughs> now, you don't get quality products if you don't treat your people well. Ackman and Company enjoyed practically zero turnover. It was first in the business, first business in the market to hire women and African Americans in our plant. We were likely the first with a profit sharing plan and paid vacations for all of our workers. Dad told me that people came to work feeling they were working for the Yankees, the best. Why would they want to work for anyone else? In fact, we had multiple father and son teams and several employees who served 50 years and we encouraged that. I'm wearing my father's 25th anniversary pin, which he gave to my mother. One last innovation. In the mid-1970s, my mother convinced my father to let her open a store on Madison Avenue. Mom's store was called VT. <laughs> that was what did it for my father as soon as she came up with the name on an airplane. Propelled by the gourmet revolution that was just getting underway with pasta and cheese in those days, it got a lot of publicity, as you can imagine, but unfortunately, it wound up having us sell our meat directly to consumers in the wrong distribution channel. The rent was too high on Madison Avenue, 
even then compared to the volume we got. Omaha Steaks and Allen Brothers had a better idea. Stick to mail order. <laughs> Meanwhile, my brother had a different idea. Move the business to Worcester, Mass. John's goal was to create manufacturing efficiencies and increase production volume to achieve greater economies of scale. Over the next 13 years, John and his partner grew their business from $10 million to $100 million. But 109 years after William Hutman and Company was acquired by Beinecke in 1999, a much larger national business acquired John's company to satisfy their own needs to increase scale. This acquisition brought an end, at least for the time being, to Atman's in the meat business. Iden and Emily Ann, it's up to you guys from here on in. <laughs> so Jack Atman's Atman and Company, rich in history, is now history. But what of that history? Is it consigned to being a footnote in New York City's commercial history? Or did Ottman and Company and its predecessors leave a larger legacy that benefits us all? I'll conclude by arguing the latter. <laughs> Today, vertically integrated meat packers in the Midwest crank out millions of pounds of meat per day using many of the techniques that we pioneered in the 1950s and 60s. A lot of this meat is vacuum packaged in successor generations of cryovac and buyback before being shipped across the country or to other countries. Fresh meats vacuum packed in cryovac are now commonplace in supermarkets, keeping meat fresh for up to 30 days compared to the three to five days in the film flimsy trays wrapped with saran. Many supermarket hamburgers are frozen just like Ottman and Company's 70 years ago. Refrigerator cases are chock full of prepared items satisfying today's consumer needs for quality and convenience just like these, like these fully pre-cooked items, just like our own Chef Ready line. And more and more Americans now roast their pot roast in bags, just like Hotman and Company enabled its customers to do so many years ago. Now, these innovations help to meet today's challenges. But what about those of tomorrow? The UN projects that by 2050 there will be 9.6 billion mouths to feed on our planet. To make sure they get enough good quality protein, the meat and meat substitute industries will need to turn up the dial on innovation. From where will their inspiration come? Perhaps from Ottman. <laughs> ways to feed generations to come by the pioneering work of five generations of Ottman and all the other families who worked with ours, the Smiths, Reardons, Gayatanis, Kesnicks, Brazels, and countless others who worked at four different Ottman companies over 140 proud years. Business, as in life, is one continuous relay race through time. Our job is to run our leg as fast as we can before pressing that baton firmly into the hands of the next generation. It's now time for a new team to advance what we started or took to a new level. 
Life moves on. A fancy brunch place illuminated with chandeliers now occupies what for us was an industrial meat freezer in our main building's ground floor. Dad and I went over there today. Upstairs, and we went upstairs, all throughout the building, the three buildings, a new generation of entrepreneurs now co-work where we once worked. Where old world style butchers once stood in lines cutting beef, now sit a new generation of digital workers in more relaxed spaces. The fact that we're all sitting here tonight, steps away from art galleries, chic boutiques, and Tony restaurants, suggests that times will continue to transform the now so-called meatpacking district. One day, the same establishments that attract crowds 24-7 will be painted over by new businesses or other entities that none of us can imagine today. <coughs> Thanks to our friends at the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation, future denizens of the now protected Gansport Market area will have the good fortune to work in ours and other architecturally stunning buildings, forging a new economy for New York while reveling in their beauty, history, and superb design. I'd like to end my talk tonight by thanking all of the Ottomans who came before me, regardless of how they spell their name. <laughs> Every day for the past 30 years that I've run my business uptown, I was inspired by the exacting standards and entrepreneurial zeal of my family members downtown. Dad, for 50 years, you rose every morning at 5 a.m. to head down to Hoffman Company. You closed the place every night at 5 p.m. before returning home to us, only to start again the next day. Thank you for never forgetting that first-class business is done in a first-class way. Thank you for sharing your memories with me so I can now share them with others. Dad, you love to tell stories and you love to hear them. I hope you've enjoyed my own hopefully fresh take on our story tonight. Happy birthday. Thank <laughs> you. 